Hi, Alessandro. Welcome. Thanks for joining Hello. me. Um, so today we're going to speak about food systems, um, particularly collaborating for averting cascading catastrophe and compounding uh, impacts based on climate and conflict. So Alessandro is joining me. He's a farmer first and also economist. He's also a senior partner at EY and leading um, agri-food and EMEA. Um, so very well suited uh, for this conversation today. We'll speak on uh, an initiative that you're leading, um, the Regenerative Agriculture Breadbasket Initiative. We'll touch on that later. Um, but first, um, you know, we're about a few days after the Agriculture Day at COP. So I woke up this morning reflecting on a few initiatives that have come out of that, that you are there for. A few acronyms, so I'm going to read them off. <laughs> um, first, the Food and Ag for Sustainable Transformation, FAST initiative. Um, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, AIM for Climate. The African Food Systems Transformation Initiative and the Rockefeller Foundation announcement to provide grants for scaling indigenous and regenerative agriculture. So that's a lot of good appetite for funding regenerative ag and food systems solutions. That's good news, right? Absolutely. Eh? <laughs> so before we get into how we can leverage this funding with the initiative that you're leading on, um, I'd just like to actually ask you to briefly explain the context. What does food systems stressed by climate and conflict actually mean? What's the, what's the connection? Absolutely. So let me, um, let me start by saying, first of all, how glad I was to see that food, agriculture, and water is solidly on the agenda at COP27. Because going back to what you're saying, there's a very strong link between our food systems and our climate change. I remember standing um, you know, in a session last week together with CGIR, FAO, the crop science industry, and a lot of um, stakeholders from food systems, and basically saying, I realized as a farmer, I'm actually a criminal. I'm responsible for a quarter of the global emissions. I'm responsible for 70% of the usage of our fresh water. I'm responsible for occupying 50% of our land mass and I'm also responsible for 64% of the biomass there as well, including myself, you know, in that sense. Um, but I realized also maybe I'm part of the solution as well. And the reality is, you know, as a farmer, you know, I produce food. But the way I produce food in the way that we cultivate today goes against nature. We're working against nature instead of working with nature. And the reality is that we did not understand until recently how, for example, our soils work, and therefore how can we work with nature to achieve both the objective of ensuring that we can feed 10 billion people by 2030, but also help significantly you know, close the gap towards our climate ambition as well. And this is what links agriculture, food, and climate in particular. And you spoke a little bit about the negative feedback loop of insecurity leading to more conflict and conflict compounding insecurity. Could you just touch on that briefly? Absolutely. And, and, you know, this comes also from the realization of a recent crisis that we went through, um, you know, during the COVID pandemic. What we saw uh, was basically an approach by countries to kind of put their hands around what they had and not sharing it. And this very quickly led to a collapse on our supply chains globally which would have been a disaster were it not for the leadership that the WHO exerted. And specifically the, the grain coming out of Russia and Ukraine. Well, this, this was the, 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 you know, what we saw there. Just imagine if the same thing happens when we have a food crisis. And like the, current, you know, the recent geopolitical events, if countries start basically stopping the flows of foods in our global food systems and you know, to keep it from themselves, this can lead to conflict. You know, if your masks are not arriving during COVID response, you get really upset. You pick up the phone and talk to the head of another state. If your food stops coming, your people start going hungry, this can lead to conflict. And we saw it already in the past when food systems started getting under pressure, prices started going up, we started facing 
major social economical crisis in many countries as well. And this can be compounded at global stage. This is why we need to move from a system that we have today, which is designed on just-in-time supply chains, long, thin supply chains, which are very efficient, to supply chains that are designed to be just-in-case. And I think agriculture and our food systems need to particularly focus on that now to, you know, to stave off any risk of famine, any risk of conflict in the future as well. So talking to you the other night about this issue and sort of negative feedback loop of conflict, you told me a personal story that I hope you'll share, which actually struck me as hopeful, but also pretty worrying as a sort of microcosm of what could be a much larger issue. It's from your farm in the south of Italy, and it was around your own regenerative practices that ended up in your neighbors calling the Carabinieri. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the, look, when I, when I took over the farm, and I'm the 12th generation farmer on the farm, so my responsibility is to hand over the farm to the next generation in a better state than I found it myself. And, um, and I remember when all of a sudden it dawned on me, I had to take this very important responsibility on behalf of my children. Um, I looked into, into it carefully, and what I'd seen, it was a constant, continuous degradation of the quality of our soils, of our yields. We're putting a lot more crop inputs to get less out of it. And I was trying to understand what was causing this. A lot of people were saying, well, it's uh, lack of water. It's, uh, you know, every year there's something new coming at you, you know, hail or whatever. But actually, when you looked scientifically at the historical data, something was happening. We could see climate change impacting, of course. Uh, you know, we are starting to get less water in, uh, in more, you know, burst styles, which were not good for soils because it will just wash them away. But generally, we are starting to see the fertility of our soils decreasing. And I said, I need to do something about it. And I started researching around this. And 12 years ago, what I found out is that there wasn't a solid body of research around what is the best way of trying to preserve our soils, preserve their fertility in the long term? Uh, but there were some indicators already. It was very fragmented, so you had to put it together many different bits and pieces and try to make up a strategy. And so we turned the farm completely organic and regenerative in, uh, in practice with the knowledge that we had at that time. And the reality is, for eight years, we lost a lot of money. Our yields dropped. Uh, our customers did not want to pay premium for biological or organic certified products. Um, and the reality is that we were not seeing any changes. After eight years, something started happening. Our yields started going up again. And I looked into that, and the soils had changed. When we looked at the samples of our soils after eight years, and I compared it to the samples that we had from when we had started this journey, it was as if you were looking at two completely different planets. One of them was soil. It was alive. It smelled good. It was full of bacteria, fungi, micronutrients, organic matter, moist. The other one was dirt. Compacted, mineral, life. You can't even get your hand in this. Couldn't even get, you know, you, you could just feel it. And um, it was quite interesting because we had a major drought recently in Italy. Um, what we found out is that we were able to keep our yields up and, and actually, if you looked at the farm using satellites, you could see that it was much greener than the environment, which was completely parched and dried out. The reason is that you know, those soils had transformed themselves and their ability to retain water, retain nutrients, and allow the plants to overcome stress from lack of water more than traditional soils as well. This gave me a lot of hope. And, uh, and it came in at a time when we are facing the current situation with our global food systems when I thought about maybe we can apply this to scale. Maybe we can actually find a way to accelerate a natural process and get into a place where we don't need to ask a farmer not to make money for eight years because I don't know, uh, you know about others, but most of the farmers cannot afford even losing one year of income. And, uh, and this is important that we need to find solutions that work for our farmers as well. That, that completely makes sense. I mean, you were in a position to be able to do that for eight years and, and see the benefits, but your neighbors 
couldn't understand what was going on. The authorities couldn't understand what was going on. Can you just absolutely? Touch on so, that? Uh, you know, this this is the thing. Um, Farmers are very conservative. So when you start changing things, people look at you, and the first thing they do is they start laughing at you because they are thinking you're cuckoo trying new things, basically. But uh, the reality is, um, and this is the big concern that I have, is that there is a lot of science. And over the last few years, I realized the wealth of research that has gone into regenerative agriculture. So there is a lot of science, a lot of, there is a lot of evidence, but it's scattered still you know, across several organizations, several bodies, and et cetera. When you bring that science together, we actually have all the tools to really make a difference, you know, potentially much faster than you can with traditional approaches by trying out. What we need to do is that we need to pass the message to the wider world, and we need to educate people. We need to give them access to science-based research in a way that they can consume it and they can understand it. Because if I go to my neighboring farmer and I talk to him about the biome, he wouldn't even know how to spell biome, I would probably say, right? So I need to explain what is it that I have in mind, you know? And so the way I try to explain it to him is think about yogurt. We're creating basically yogurt there. In, in our specific situation, because of the changes that were happening, people believed that we were, for example, irrigating at night our, our farm during an irrigation Which wasn't bomb, allowed because... Which was not allowed. A drought, yeah. Because during a drought, you're not allowed to irrigate. To the point that we had an inspection, of course, they couldn't find any wells, they couldn't find any irrigation equipment, and they couldn't understand what was going on here, right? And, and I told her, I remember this inspector, you know, stick your fingers in the, in the soil. You know, he could actually penetrate the soil with his fingers, and he could and it was moist, it was, it was soil, right? And I asked him to go, you know, next door, across the road, where there was a traditional field, and it was a crust, and he couldn't even go through it as well. So this is how people realize that we can do something about this, and we can change our approach as well. Thank you for that story. Um, so I'd like to move on to the initiative that all of this has been motivating um, in, in recent times. And you spoke to me about the urgency. I mean, we, we can't wait for COP28 for more launch uh, commitments and pledges. You said, if we don't do something in the next couple of months, we'll miss the next harvest, and then we'll have to wait another year. And we don't have that kind of time. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about your initiative? What is it? Um, and what is your ambition? Absolutely. Um, going back to what I was saying before, um, we are relying on this very long and thin supply chains at the moment. And any shock to that system is a shock to our global food systems. Um, we saw the recent geopolitical situation basically curtailing access to an area that was accountable uh, for the majority of the exporting specific staple crops that feed our world as well. The reality is we cannot be dependent only on few areas. We need to basically move to a model where we have, I call them several bread baskets, but I don't like the word bread because it you know, implies wheat. Because you know, we need to think about all the major crop systems that we need to enable globally. And we need to move to an area where we you know, focus more for local for local, you know, this just in case uh, approach. And uh, the reality is that we need millions of hectares of agricultural land, not only to feed our growing population, but also to reduce dependency on any given region that might be subject to geopolitical issues or to climate conditions that could wipe out entire crops and put our food systems at risk. And what we did is, as you know, we are heavily involved in, uh, in agriculture and food systems. We used our remote sensing capabilities to scan the world and identify areas where we have marginal lands that have been maybe compacted, overgrazed, basically lands that have been abandoned, uh, but are in the right climatic zones, in the right soil areas, where we could actually aim to restore them at scale and bring them back to, uh, you know, to production. And we thought, just imagine if we could do this, we could really pull our global knowledge and even do that leveraging some of the best uh, you know, regenerative agricultural practices and technology that are available to us so we can have, make an impact in a matter of years instead of decades in terms of not just restoring the yields of those lands but also you know, sequestering large amounts of uh, you know, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
and we identified four areas around the world. One of them, East Africa in particular, is so important because it's so dependent on imports. And I think this is the area that we'd like to focus on. And I, in the meeting that we had last week, I, 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 and I made a call for action and said, let's make it happen now. You know, COP27 is supposed to be a COP of implementation. We have the tools, we have a broad consensus, we've got access to capital, we've got access to the experts, we can go and make a difference right now and put in place one of the first programs, large-scale programs, to restore abandoned lands, bring them back into production, and adopt regenerative agricultural practices at scale. And reduce reliance on imports from Correct. countries in conflict. Not only, but also help develop the downstream value chain for processing those crops in those countries so that, again, we go into this local for local approach, absolutely, and create a much wider impact, both economically and socially as well. So what kind of actors are you working with or hope to scale this up for, uh, to work with? Yeah, we, I, think, I think the blueprint is very similar to our response to COVID, you know, where we have you know, a global actor, in that case it was the WHO, in this case it's you know, CGIR and FAO that can drive basically with their leadership the, the approach. Um, what I found works very well and worked very well in the past is this private-public relationship where also civil society participates. This is what made us capable of doing something nobody thought was possible during our COVID response. And I think by bringing our minds to get together and our resources together, um, you know, we can achieve something that otherwise will take many years to do. Sovereign wealth funds, crop science companies, experts, research institutes, policy makers, they all need to converge to make this reality. Do you have a practical example of how, for example, private investor um, and a local organization can come together to leverage those funds and all of those commitments that we spoke about earlier to actually implement some of those regenerative practices and transition uh, unused land, for example, in East Africa? Absolutely. So we actually did already, um, let's say, a pre-feasibility pre study in terms of how we could architect and integrate such, a, such an approach. You said a fundamental word there, which is local. What doesn't work is to take global ideas and just bang them into a local state and, uh, and hope that they're going to work. The way regenerative agriculture works is when you listen to local knowledge, when you involve the local experts and you bring the challenge, the research, the data to help basically localize the approach to make it work in that specific situation. This is fundamental for the future. This is why we need to have local stakeholders involved with global stakeholders to design something together to make it work. So we're running out of time, but just one more quick, quick answer, and then I want to take one question from the audience. Um, do you have a call to action on how do we build this initiative in the next couple of months? How do we scale this? What, who do you yeah. need? What do you need? The most important thing that I need, um, when I was in that session, I was, uh, no, last week, I was basically preaching to the converted. The people were in that session because they know that regenerative agriculture can work and can make an impact. What we need to do, we need to spread the word and we need to basically bring people that are unaware of these practices to the same level of knowledge. In particular, you know, what the call for action for me is also for us all to share our knowledge and to present it in a way that people can understand it and can consume it as well, so that they come on board on this transformation. Because if you can make it happen, if you can find a way to speed up those natural cycles to restoring soils, we can make not just an impact on food systems and food security, but also to take a fundamental part in helping us bridge the gap to our climate ambition by using soils as formidable carbon sinks in the world. So that's, that's my key request. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you. I'd like to take one question, if there's 30 seconds. Any questions? Thank you very much. I am Catherine Corona, where we're indigenous uh, peoples, organizations. I would like to know how you involve local communities and indigenous people. How is that, that approach? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so. Um, I'll give you an example, maybe, which is highly relevant for East Africa. 
in regenerative agriculture, the combination of farming and grazing is fundamental. You actually need animals to be on the fields to actually you know, graze the land, in particular the cover crops that you put into that, and also so that we can use the manure to rapid or to speed up basically the transformation of the biome or in the, the creation of the biome in those soils. So, you know, from when humankind started farming, we already started a conflict between farmers and herders. And this is where we really need to pass a new message. It is not an or situation, it's an and situation. If we adopt you know, regenerative agriculture practices, herders become part of the solution and they benefit from cover crops which are rich in nutrients and they can help grow basically their cattle, their sheep, you know, in, uh, or the goats into, in, in better animals with more value, nutritional value also for the local communities. This is how you typically engage also with the representatives of these communities or the actually weaker parts of the communities to, uh, you know, to benefit from these kind of schemes. One important thing is also for me is small holders. It's great to come in with the best technology and the best thinking and put in place large-scale advanced agricultural operations. And we've seen some beautiful you know, pilots in East Africa where we went from one ton per hectare of yields to three, four tons per hectare. So the potential is there to really make an impact. The question is, how do we actually transmit some of these practices to small orders as well so they can start work, using work them? With, work with them. And work with them as well. And the fundamental approach here would have to be this knowledge transfer, not only to help the small orders in the catchment area of some of these model farms to learn by seeing how these practices are adopted so they can copy them on their own plots, but also to give them access to high quality, low cost crop inputs and the ability also to sell their crops potentially at a better price and avoid having to go through several layers of middle men that all make a markup on their crops as well in a way is to leave more money behind for small orders as well.